So the next session is a panel discussion, and we have uh, five panel members who will join us on the stage. Three of the five panel members has already given presentation at this uh, meeting. Amanda Clark, Sarah Tittman, and Sergio Pasca. Um, two panel members that um, is hasn't presented here. So um, Robert Nafabach and Magdalena Siddekagurs. So may I ask um, Robin just to say a few words about yourself? Okay. Um, so do we stand or just stay sitting? Sorry? Stand or sitting? Never mind. Okay. So I'm Robin Nafabach. Um, I'm a scientist based at the Francis Crick Institute. But I guess the reason I'm on this panel is that um, I've served several roles um, outside of my bench science. Um, I sit on two committees for the Human Fertilization and Embryo Authority, with both advisory committees. One is a sort of standing committee I've been on for a while, which is Scientific and Clinical Advances Advisory Committee. Uh, the other is a, is a much more uh, recent committee, which is looking at potential legislative changes because uh, the... Um, HFA Act uh, hasn't really been changed substantially since 2008. An awful lot has happened in science since then. Um, so it's getting very tired and it needs a lot <laughs> of changes, not just for research, but for all sorts of other things, how you deal with patients, for example. Um, and then I was, uh, I chaired the uh, task force that updated the, the guidelines issued by the ISSCR, the National Society for Stem Cell Research. Um, which were the guidelines, new guidelines, were published last year. So um, uh, there's international guidelines. So. Thank you. Magdalena? Uh, so I'm Magdalena Gosh. I may have to put it here. So I'm Magdalena Zernicka Goetz, and I have been working for mouse embryos for most of my life. And it's around seven to eight years ago we developed a culture system to look at the development of human embryos through the stages of implantation. So this allows us to look at what happens to our own embryos at the time when they implant, and the three major tissues that become set up by the time of implantation interact with each other and how they morph into something much more complex. And as you know, this is possible to study real human embryos until day 14, so that's the time of gastrulation. So one aspect of our discussion today is you know, should we consider of moving this boundary forward uh, or should we not? And if we should, where should this time be? And the other thing that we have done, and perhaps that's why I'm here, that we develop um, stem cell model system. So as a postdoc, I was in Martin Evans' lab and I learned how to uh, play with mouse and then human stem cells to really try to put them together as embryo would do, so by combining stem cells, embryonic stem cells, with two types of extra embryonic stem cells, those ones that will build trophoectoderm and, uh, and primitive endoderm-derived tissue or hypoblast-derived tissue, which is called extra embryonic uh, visceral endoderm. So to putting, putting these two and then three types of stem cells together allow us to build so-called integrated model uh, of a mouse and potentially human embryo development. So again, the question is, should we build those models and um, what do they provide us with and how we should regulate this type of work so it does not um, develop in the wrong way? Thank you. So um, today's um, topic for discussion is technical, ethical and legal challenges of studying early human development. Before we start, I would like to put a scope of development in defining what is the period of early human development we are going to uh, be concerned of. So early human development covers the period of development from fertilization to around six weeks post-fertilization. By the end of the second week, gastrulation started and then by two and a half to three weeks, gastrulation is regarded as complete. And from then onward, there will be the generation of the various organ primordia, 
in the body until by six weeks, major organogenesis, early organogenesis will be completed and followed by organogenesis and maturation. In this context, the lack of natural biospecimen across early human development has proposed a challenge. We don't even have a detailed molecular cell atlas of early human embryos after gastrulation to the time of completion of organogenesis. Although recently, there's a bioarchive preprint that is uh, posted that cover um, single cell atlas of human at four to six weeks of development, seven embryos covering Carnegie stage 12 to Carnegie stage 15, 16. So some of this ground information as cell atlas are gradually be available, but there is still a big gap in this early human development period that probably the way, as Sarah indicated, the studying of embryo models or embryo models may actually fill the gap of those uh, information. And that is the basis of the knowledge we need in order to understand the developmental mechanism over this period of the time. So today we are going to focus on the utility of uh, embryo models. So I would like to uh, start with Amanda to talk about um, the modeling <laughs> of reproductive biology. Um, well, I, I so um, I know the, the most of you in the room heard my talk yesterday uh, that you know I'm a stem cell scientist and I'm interested uh, in reproductive uh, development uh, as well as reproductive disease and in particular the disease of infertility. Uh, but I also wanted to add to that I was also on the subcommittee of Robin's task force for the International Society of Stem Cell Research, which was to update the guidelines for using stem cells uh, and uh, in generation of embryo models and thinking about the 14-day rule as well. So I just wanted to make sure um, that was on the table too. Um, so in our lab, we're interested in the germline, and the germline is specified during very early embryo development, and if it's not specified, as you know, uh, then that will lead to certain infertility. The germline is essential for fertility, yet then we understand very little about the process of germ cell formation because it forms during a time, uh, as Patrick pointed out, where we have, it's very difficult to access this type of tissue for research. So what the embryo model does is it opens up spatio and temporal approaches for us to be able to understand how the early human germline forms. And we can partner that then with organoid type models uh, to take those germ cells which are forming in one place and then combine them with uh, later stage embryonic cells to build ovarian organoids in order to understand how the ovary forms, how the testis forms. Uh, and start combining those with other organoid type approaches, uh, as we've heard today. Uh, how, do they, how do these um, early embryos interact with the uterus? We understand very little about that, yet then 30% of pregnancies are lost um, in, the, in this early stage uh, within the first few weeks. And so, so I think the embryo models create this amazing opportunity in reproductive biology, fertility and infertility to answer questions that um, will give knowledge to patients who are trying to have a family and can't. And they really are, are, are very desperate for this knowledge so they can understand avenues to take to have a family of their own. Um, Magdalena, would you like to comment on the embryo model that allows us to study post-implantation development in model organism, including human? As do you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, indeed, uh, as Amanda said, these early stages of human development are extremely enigmatic because at this stage, um, human embryo is still very, very small. So we actually cannot detect it through any uh, instruments through the body of the mother. So to be able to understand how the different type of stem cells that become set up by the time of implantation, which is epiblast, hypoblast, and trophoectoderm interact with each other to uh, initiate the process of the growth. This is really for the first time when the growth become initiated. So how we regulate the uh, right speed of the growth, 
to which extent those extra embryonic tissues are really essential for controlling this growth. We know that when they mal malfunction, this is when the implantation failure uh, will take place. It's extremely important. So I believe that building those models, maybe first in the mouse, that's what I would say, to really understand what happens and what are the limitations of those models, and then to be able to translate this knowledge to help us really understand what happens when three-dimensional tissues of the human embryo are created, interact with each other, and interact in the right uh, form and uh, you know, to regulate size of the embryo also at that stages, which we know is critical, is really going to move us forward to understand why so many pregnancies fail, but also how we can use this knowledge to create and repair organs in the future when they fail. So the um, embryo model also allow us to understand in the field of precision medicine the disease causing mechanism and the identification of potential therapeutic targets, especially dealing with early developmental disorders. Um, so how would you see the embryo model could contribute to that particular aspect of the knowledge and therefore with the limitation at the moment, strict to the pregastulation stage, a challenge to deliver that knowledge base. That's me again. Okay. So, uh, yes, yeah, so Patrick is raising a very important question. You know, to which extent we can look at these early stages of our own development by using human embryos versus human embryo models? So, I work with both, and I can tell you that uh, the number of uh, human embryos that are donated. Uh, to research is, is very small. So we really need those real human embryos to be able to understand how development happens to be normal. But if we can mimic those stages of development with the putting together different type of stem cells that can interact with each other and form normal tissues will be extremely important for, for example, drug testing. Uh, we know that certain reagents at that stages of pregnancies are the ones that, um, that women know um, are detrimental for development, but we often do not know what it is and how it acts. So these stages of development that often women don't know they are pregnant, but in many cases they are expecting that they will be pregnant, we can have an access to. So I think that's the one of the questions that I'm hoping we in the lab and many of us will be able to address by looking at human embryo model rather than, than real human embryo. So one of the major challenge in uh, modeling development is that if you really want to understand it properly and have the right set of information, you have to consider how much of the level of fidelity that your model has recapitulated natural development. And this is very important in gathering information, for example, for the self tablets. So using embryo model to cover that gap of uh, development would be a reasonable approach. But how much fidelity do we need in order to capture those information so that we have a really reliable ground truth knowledge? Sarah. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, I'm Sarah Teichmann from the Wacom Sanger Institute and the University of Cambridge and um, co-founder and co-lead of the Human Cell Atlas International Consortium. Um, the, so, so I agree with you that obviously, you know, for, for um, understanding mechanisms, for drug screening, um, you know, for many applications for, of in vitro systems, as Magdalena said, we would want the models to be as faithful to the in vivo system as possible. And, um, you know, the, the, the ultimate kind of single cell resolution, full molecular breadth sort of assessment of that is through the single cell genomics and sort of spatial genomics, uh, uh, quantitative computational assessment that I mentioned, for instance, for in vivo thymus development, in vitro thymus development, and so on. And, and um, you know, you can do those comparisons at the single cell level, you can do them in terms of developmental trajectories, in terms of cell microenvironments, and so on, develop various computational measures to, um, to quantify that. Uh, I guess, you know, the, from a, from a uh, as Magdalena said, from a biology point of view, the challenge is that the in vivo material is so restricted and limited in these early stages. 
and, and that's why I guess each, each one of these samples and their characterization is so valuable. And we've seen um, sort of some, some forays into that domain, as you said, going earlier, kind of backwards, if you like, sort of in, uh, from post-conception week six, if that's where you're kind of starting the, the timeline <coughs> in development. And, um, and, and I guess also for pre-implantation development, you know, there are, there are samples. And so, so I guess in that way, we can sort of go from both ends on the human side. And then um, the, the other way of thinking about this is to look at a model organism like the mouse and then say, okay, if we mimic the, the, the uh, in vitro assembly and the in vitro systems in the mouse, how similar is that to the in vivo mouse? And can we kind of extrapolate and learn something where there might be gaps in human? I mean, that would be my suggestion. I should also mention people have said they are sort of like co committee work and so on and so forth. So I've advised and presented to the um, National Academy of Sciences and Royal Society Joint Committee, committee on um, uh, germline gene editing and, and, and sort of how the, the um, cell atlas data of human development um, can inform us on the consequences of, of germline gene editing. Uh, yeah. just for Thank you. So the ISCL guideline has raised the concept of integrated versus non-integrated embryo models. The assumption is if it's fully integrated, it will recapitulate most of the natural phenomenon of development. So Robin, would you like to comment on this um, conceptual classification and what is the <coughs> imperative of these two types of models? Um, well, Amanda can comment as well. She was on that, um, that group that came up with the term. So I think, you know, so it's easy to say, well, a, a non-integrated model is one that doesn't have extra embryonic tissues, so couldn't possibly implant or develop further. That's simple. An integrated model is one where you do have some extra embryonic cell types, so potentially it could go a lot further. Um, but of course, for a human, um, you would only know that if you're able to transplant it into a human uterus, which I think would be forbidden everywhere. Um, so you never quite know. Um, so it's always going to be a slightly theoretical description, mm -hmm. but, but you know, it's, it's, it can't possibly have the potential to go further to implant if it doesn't have any extra embryonic tissues. If it does, then it might do. So um, that is essentially the, the mm -hmm. distinction between the two. Uh, we wanted to avoid the use of too many other terms. Um, I should say at the outset, we hate uh, using synthetic, so please try and avoid using synthetic. That's something that's plastic or whatever. Um, <laughs> it's not something that has come from either embryonic stem cells, which come from an embryo, or from iPS cells, which have come from cells donated by a person. So you know, you have to be a little sensitive to these things. Um, uh, you know, gastroloid is that a, is that a useful term when it's something that doesn't actually undergo gastrulation? Uh, <laughs> blastoid is a, is a little unclear to me. So. Calling them stem cell based embryo models is a, lo is a, is a lot of words, but at least it's, um, it's accurate. Amanda, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, so, um, so the ISSCR guidelines are, are used by many journals uh, that publish our research. And so, um, so, for those of you who do work with embryos, you'll know um, that uh, your work often goes through an ethics review as well by these journals to ensure that. Uh, that you're following uh, the, um, the rules in your jurisdiction, basically, and different rules are different in jurisdictions. Uh, but the ISSCR guidelines um, is a way of trying to normalize stem cell science across the world, uh, being mindful of these different jurisdictions. So, um, yeah, I was just to say that the, you know, the, the non-integrated ones, we felt, posed relatively few challenges in terms right. of... Right, and so the previous ISSCR yeah. guidelines were ambiguous about yeah. these new models that were emerging. So the challenge was, as scientists, the sciences were being much faster than regulation was. Mm -hmm. And so this update in the guidelines, I think it's the first update, and is it perfect? No, but I think it pr yeah. created a frame, so for future updates, um, this can be further improved. Um, but if you look at the previous guidelines, the, it was it, that um, making uh, embryo-like structures uh, was part of the, um, the 
activities that were recommended to be prohibited. Yeah. So that meant all of these emerging uh, models that had spatio-temporal um, uh, positional information uh, uh, under the framework of the ISSCR guidelines were not allowable and were, were recommended to be prohibited. So, so in order to create a pathway forward, given how promising this research is uh, for new discoveries, fundamental knowledge, uh, for screening, uh, for understanding um, uh, early development, birth defects, uh, potentially um, other aspects that we haven't dreamed up yet. Uh, the, these guidelines created a, a, a path forward for, for doing that and, and started to think about how this could be updated in the future. So, so do, we have a, do we have a name which we recommend to use uh, to describe those structures? So we, we tend to refer to them as stem cell embryo models, but of course there's uh, many words, but nevertheless if this is the safest way to use mm -hmm. um, the name, then if we agree that that's how we should refer to all of them as a community, this would be how really super. How embryoid? Which is like embryo? It's like? A, that's a bit like embryoid body. That's the problem. very different. Yeah. So but, it's, but it's not. Different. And embryoid bodies are no longer used. Is that well, <laughs> they are. I think like not as much. Yeah. No. Um, it's also the general public too, because yeah, remember, yeah. you know, we have to communicate what we're it's doing true. to the general public, and and given what we're talking about um, uh, is something the public's very interested in, and we want to engage the public, we want to bring them along with decisions. Yeah. I think using terms that um, that they're unsure about can be a challenge. So embryoid actually is uh, they're a little nervous about the word yeah. embryoid. Um, yeah. But, yeah. but, but you could also argue that organoid is even less accurate because most of these organs are not full. I mean, the organogenesis is much more difficult to recapitulate, perhaps, than like even earlier stages, right? And yet we just go with it. Yeah, um, yeah that, in fact, in today's question I want to pose to you. Let Robin finish. Say one, yeah. So if, you know, if you're going to argue that your embryo model, particularly uh, an integrated embryo model, is a model of normal human embryo, then clearly it has to be close to a normal human embryo um, for it to be uh, valid to use as a model. Mm -hmm. And the closer they get, the more the public will worry about this. And so this is why it has to be looked at very carefully um, and ha maybe re be regulated. So, and the, the, the guidelines say that um, an integrated uh, stem cell based embryo model should be subject to um, uh, ethical review oversight. Um, mm. uh, and that, that is very, we think that is probably very important because if you really want the public to be behind your research, then you need some, some guidelines to follow. So um, we heard a lot on the brain organoid today. Um, as you raised, whether organoids should actually recapitulate the early phases of organogenesis for example, before six weeks, where the embryonic brain primordia is just set up. And the other issue is, if you are, in your example, when you are looking at the projection of the neuron from one brain part to the other brain part, how reproducible is that particular pattern of projection? And how do you know which particular projection is the productive connection yeah. that you can do functional assay? And whether the reproducibility of the patterning is critical so that you can mimic the natural connecting pattern. So that is an issue. And the other is, if you have that projection, do you need the right target brain area in order to generate that pattern? For example, if you have an assembly or retinal organoid with the brain, does the brain organoid part has to have a tactile cortex? Yeah. So again, it's a fidelity issue. Okay, so issue. there are like multiple aspects. So maybe I should like try to address them systematically. I mean, the, the more you advance in human brain development, the more difficult it's going to be to accurately recapitulate what is happening, particularly because experience becomes even, ever more important right, in brain development. So it's not just that the brain assembles itself. At one point, it does so under the direct influence of sensory input or other uh, regions of the brain. So I think. There's no doubt that the more we advance with these models, it's going to be more difficult to accurately recapitulate those aspects. So I think that's one point to keep in mind. Now, there are <coughs> some very robust 
And yet, the, the, you know, and yet the way we build the human brain is incredibly robust, right? We, to a large extent, we all have kind of like a similar brain. Right? The brain like assembles itself, although despite its complexity and heterogeneity, it puts itself together all the time in a similar way. So there must be some very robust mechanisms that assemble. And I think to some extent, we're tapping precisely into those. So for instance, we've discovered that if you make a cortical organoid and you put it together with the spinal cord, a specific subpopulation of cells will go there. But if you put it with the striatum, another population of cells will go. So that tells us that you know, some cues are present. And the moment you make those cells, you also provide that information that is necessary. Now, that is not to say that you've completely made that circuit. Because that circuit will involve refinement, myelination, you know, loss of those. So I think at some basic level, we can recapitulate some of that interaction. And I think that's where my third point comes, which is like what we name these structures that we're building is very important. So it's certainly you know, inappropriate, not to mention bluntly inaccurate scientifically, to call these structures mini brains. Mm -hmm. In the effort that we've put together, which will come this nomenclature effort, where you know, 19 groups we came together over the past year and discussed, this is the term that we discourage the community from using and the public because the first reaction is that this is a miniature brain. It never was. That was never really the case. It was always parts of the nervous system that are obviously incomplete, but it's enough for the public to become confused about what is being built. And so is when you also refer, for instance, to transplantation studies, right? You know, we also discourage the use of the term, for instance, humanized animals. I know that very often that is used in immunology and may be yeah. quite accurate because you remove the, you know, the immune system and you put a human. But we're not doing that here. We're not some removing it's the nervous some system. Elements. It's, it's some elements. Exactly. It's never so it doesn't mean that it's humanized. And even when you say humanized, humanized to what extent? Um, so I, I think that's why, for instance, in this nomenclature effort, we like to, you know, we recommend that one should refer to the transplanted or engrafted organoid or assembloid rather than to the animal in this case and the features. So I think we have to be very careful about what, you know, and, and, and certainly as, as we discussed, the organic term is not necessarily the most fortunate term to use, right? Not tissue, necessarily. I mean, tissue is it more but at, at one point, I guess, you know, it's the community not. just went on and that's what we use. And, <laughs> you know, it, it has an oil in it, in it, right? Which I think to a large extent means that it's not the same. But um, certainly the problem is, and that brings the ethical issues for the neuroscience community is that, or just in general for the public, that certainly the more brain-like, human brain-like these models become, the more uncomfortable we feel. And yet we know that if we want to understand psychiatric disorders, we need our models to be as human brain-like as needed. So I think that's where there's a moral you know, aspect of it and yet a responsibility to try to understand the psychiatric disorders that you know, affect 25% of the population. So do you, can I ask you, do you use the word chimera in your studies? So we don't recommend the term chimera for transplantations unless the transplantation has been done very early in development okay. and then human cells have contributed to a large portion of the nervous system. Yeah. Okay. And the reason why we don't recommend it is, first of all, because it triggers mm -hmm. emotive reaction. It's enough to Google the term and realize yeah that it refers to mythical creatures, and that's obviously not what we're trying to do. Mm. And so we also recommend against the use of the term chimera. Although, again, it may be appropriate for like early stages. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I think the use of the term chimera has some biological connotation, that it become a new species, so to speak. But um, if the term has been used, for example, mm. in the immune system, I mean, yeah. transplanted yeah. immune system, yeah. Yeah. for, yeah, for, for often, did many yeah. decades, so yeah. it's a hard one to avoid. Yeah. Um, but but there, there is stem cell transplantation, yeah. and it does yeah. contribute to multiple yeah. lineages. That's right. Um, yeah. But there, it's also been used, I mean, we can yeah. go into details yeah. here, it's also been used for just where certain molecules yeah. are. I think yeah. I mean, you can counter this by saying, you know, many people who've had a bone marrow transplant, for example, yeah. are chimeras, and right. so you, yeah. you just try and calm down yeah. the understanding of the, the term right. by saying, look, there are probably people in the audience who are yeah. primarily. So, so a similar uh, system <laughs> is seen in the cancer research field yeah. that you engraft tumor cells into a syngenic or a, a animal yeah. 
you call it PTX models, you never mention it's a chimera. It's almost the same as the brain yeah, transplant. It's true, but I think what's, you know, what is particularly, you know, triggers emotive reactions is are interspecies chimeras. Mm -hmm. And people are like, understand that we may all be chimeras, that you may get a transplant and you're essentially a chimera, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But when you think about like interspecies chimera, especially interspecies chimeras from species that are close evolutionarily, that becomes particularly challenging, right? So I would like to uh, put it to the audience. Yep, James. So, I mean, I understand terminology is important here, but I don't, in the end, I don't think the public are going to, that's <coughs> not going to be the thing that persuades the public, right? So what, what matters in many cases is what people consider natural and unnatural, and what the intent and purpose is. So how, what's the way forward here? So how do we progress the discussion in a way that is, is constructive in, in arriving at the end that we think we want to arrive at? Um, when, um, when you talk to um, people who, who don't like the idea, for example, of extending the 14-day day rule, um, or even those who may support it, but um, they, they always say, well, the scientists have to put together a very strong scientific case for doing it. And, you know, you can, we, you know, I can say, well, there are many justifications for doing it, which is to understand normal development, understand what goes wrong, try and um, find um, treatments for things. You know, you can, you can mention something like, um, you know, the, the use of folic acid to prevent um, spina bifida, for example, um, how that's an example of where you can use something, um, a small molecule, to overcome a big problem. Um, you can say, well, yeah, we know that works, but mothers have to take folic acid from before they get pregnant all the way through term, and that may be bad. We don't know. So being able to use these models to do, or, or normal embryo cultures to define a specific um, window would be, would be helpful. We can say all of this. And they still come back and said, well, the scientists have to build a strong scientific case. So we just have to sit down and write this all out and, and, and you know, spell it out in, in very simple terms to, to persuade people. I mean, that's my, I mean, my personal view. Uh, it's, you know, there is very strong scientific case. Uh, you have to understand what the counter arguments are there as well. Sarah. So... I mean, my, my feeling is that it's the, the kind of medical utility and, and the doing good kind of element that, that's persuasive. Uh, so kind of what you ended up with was saying, was the example of the, uh, the folic acid. Yeah. And it's, it's basically the confidence of the public that we want to do good yeah. and not bad. <laughs> I think that's the lesson that I take home from the human genetics community that I've kind of interacted with, yeah. you know, uh, tangentially over the years. Um, being at a genomics institute, that's obviously a, a you know a significant topic kind of for us, and it's it's you know you want to do good kind of with the the genetic predispositions for for various genetic variation syndromes, disorders, and so on. You don't want to do eugenics, yeah. and it's that it's that good versus bad. I'll put it very simplistically, yeah. but it's that we want to contribute to the good of society going forwards and human health essentially, rather than you know our own interest in something evil. That, that I think will, will be persuasive. So I yeah. should add to this just the comment that Sarah made, which I often use because I talk about human embryo research and also human em building human embryo models. So I always stress that we are building those models to really not to have to use human embryos or have to use human embryos to know how to cure mm. and how to prevent uh, disorders that happens exactly at the time of implantation that the majority of the pregnancies fail as a result of it. Okay. So I think that I've noticed that as soon as I say that, that I actually work on human embryos and I do not want to use exclusively those to understand how we can fix the problem, then people sort of realize that there is a, uh, the value of the models that we are building. So it's sort of that thought to, yeah, that, that really is extremely important to stress. And it's interesting because you brought up the issue of like evil and yeah, I'm sorry to mention this here, but, it, but, but, but I think, it, but, but I think it's, it's a very valid point. I mean, you look in the common kind of like literature and even the perception. I mean, tell me how many examples of like scientist heroes 
are there? Because in every single, like, Dr. Frankenstein is, like, bad <laughs> from the beginning until the end. They always go awry, right? Dr. Octopus is, like, <laughs> bad. Je you know, Dr. Jekyll and Hyde, it's also bad. Like, all the scientists that are, start with very good intentions, for some reason, and all the stories end up, like, not being aware. I mean, that's not really happening. That's not what we're trying to do here. And, and I'm sorry to say, but that is the perception very often of the public, right? Yeah. That, you know, we're trying to do some evil experiments where, in fact, like, the motivation for all of us right. has been to really understand disease or understand what makes us uniquely human. Mm -hmm. And I think that needs to be conveyed to the public. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the clinicians so have a key role to play. Yeah. Yeah, well, the well. patient groups, the patients, so whether that it's infertility or whether it's genetic disease or whatever, Having that link is really important. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Emma? Hi, I've been interacting with a public group quite a lot recently as a long-term public engagement project. And we've been talking to them mostly about later stages of human development, not this early stage. But I want to pick up a little more what Sarah said, because I think it's really interesting. One of the questions we get then is if we're talking about, no one would <coughs> argue that spina bifida is a terrible condition and we should be doing what we can to cure it. But if we're talking about something that you could describe as human variation versus disease, if we're on that spectrum, particularly for someone in the neurodiverse community, we then get the question back, who makes the decision? And I find that very difficult to deal with. I'm very interested to know what the panel thinks. Yeah. How do we decide what we should be curing? Well, actually, I, w I, wanna, I wanna take this, because, um, <laughs> because as, a, as a physician, and actually, my main expertise is in autism spectrum disorders. And, you know, I, I know that that is a valid point, certainly about diversity. But the majority of cases with autism are incredibly severely affected patients. That many of them have epileptic seizures, up to 60 per day, fail to interact socially, have severe intellectual disability. So I think that is the target. Not those, I mean, we're, nobody's going to be treated if they don't want to be treated. But the reality is when you interact with these families and the foundations, they're desperate for solutions. And they're desperate because they also think that development is moving and we're not intervening fast enough. Mm -hmm. And that is actually the case. We see this with the recent success for spinal muscular atrophy, which again, until recently, was a sentence to death for most of the cases. And today, if you intervene early with antisense oligonucleotides, you can actually prolong that. That is really a miracle of modern science to a large extent. And we now know that the earlier you intervene, the more recovery or the more prevention of the damage is being done. I mean, those are the populations that we are going for, right? Uh, and and mm -hmm. certainly there are always you know, conditions, even for neuropsychiatric spectrum, there are not, but in the case of autism, you know, the heritability contribution to autism is very, very high. It's close to 90%, mm -hmm. right? Most, most of the syndromic forms that are about 20% are incredibly severe multisystemic disorders. Mm. So I think the public also needs to understand this, that our target are very severe conditions primarily, mm -hmm. and nobody's being forced to be treated, mm. right? And I think the same goes for infertility, that often people yeah. don't realize that infertility is a disease. This really leads to drama, and I think Amanda yesterday made a great case for that to think about it from that perspective. And it's not something like a luxury to have a child, right? It should be something that everybody should have a right to have. I'll, I'll certainly agree on infertility, but just coming back to, there's one thing freaking the, the public out with terminology, but there's also overpromising, And even the most complex CNS models we can build, are we really gonna tell the, the public that that's going to target the 25% of, of, of people who have a psychiatric diagnosis, that seems like a very, very dangerous position to get ourselves in. I, I'm not, not sure I get the question. Yeah. Can you? Uh, whether we so are so to, say, to, to say on the one hand that 25% of people will be affected by a psychiatric disorder, and so it's a very important question is one thing. To say that assembloids or cerebral organoids are going to be a way that we can start to target that question, that seems a long way in the future and, and, and a sort of difficult argument to use to support this type of work. Diagnostically or therapeutically? Either. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so the question yeah, really is, is it appropriate to use the organoid system to look at neurodevelopmental disorders that you need to 
actually provide therapy at the early onset phase, so that is didn't get to the point of no return, no matter treatment you provide. That is particularly strong in pediatric cases of genetic disease like SMA. Yeah. Yeah, and early detection, early treatment before the onset of a symptom actually will provide a curative um, um, cure. And this is, has been done in Australia with gene therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, follow, uh, the gene therapy is follow what we call um, intensive care genomic. You get a genetic diagnosis within uh, 72 hours after birth and implement the gene therapy within a month after birth, and that is the way to go. Yeah. But I think the other question is that uh, the psychiatric issues, whether the brain organ or is the way to go. Yeah. I, mean, it, I, mean, I'm not, I mean, nobody's saying that it's gonna replace other models. They should be used in a complementary way. But I, I, I'm not sure, should we just like stop and not study psychiatric disorders because the models may not be good enough or they may not have an intervention. I mean, we could have stopped like research in SMA because it's such a severe disease that causes like death in six months, right? But we haven't stopped there. And the majority of psychiatric disorders, again, I mean, we're going after psychiatric disorders that are tractable from a genetic point of view, right? Most of those are like highly penetrant, cause severe uh, conditions, right? Uh, and for other disorders that are, you know, and more, more all psychiatric disorders are on a spectrum. They're all psychiatric disorders are behaviorally defined at the end of the day. Right, so certainly they're like challenges, but the way you know, this has been tackled primarily by looking at genetic conditions at this point. Uh, yes. I just want to add one thing. I think Harry actually, he brought up a really good point, and it makes me think about when I was a postdoc at UCSF in the early days of embryonic stem cells, who so are now talking in the US, but I think it was similar in other parts of the world too, where uh, in order to, um, in order uh, for there to be more funding at the federal level for embryonic stem cell research, there was a, a lot of discussion with public, perhaps telling the public, uh, if you support this type of research, there's going to be all these cures that are going to emerge as a consequence of embryonic stem cell research. And I still believe that that is the case, and look how far we've come in these 20 years. But what we didn't do is tell the public that science is a bit unpredictable in how we make um, advances, and sometimes um, it's, it doesn't go as quickly. I think they assumed we'd have cures for everything in a decade, and of course we all know that's not the case. So, so I think that's probably what Harry meant by his question: is that um, you know being realistic with the with the general public as well, and on science, how long science takes, and. Um, we could discover the unexpected. I have, I have some very you know, good friends who are journalists, um, but the question they, they are very prone to ask is, well, you talk about this beautiful bit of science, basic, basic research, and they say, well, how long is it going to take before we have a cure for this? And I just say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to answer that question. If I said five years, that you know that's ridiculous. If I say 20 years, you'll get say, well, that's boring, we're not interested. <laughs> so and I'm, I'm not going to give you a, like 10 or 15 years, because we absolutely have no idea. You know, it takes a long time, just a conventional drug, it will take 10 years or more to get it through the system. Yeah. So. So, so, so we'll take one comment over there and then go to the live stream. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, changing gears a bit. Could you just speak up a little bit, please? Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. That seems like it. Um, hi, so changing gears a bit, thinking about kind of the ethical complications and really the regulatory complications and the universality of the regulatory complications. When I think about the way that the human embryo work itself has been regulated, particularly I think successfully in the UK with the HFEA, um, and how that was brought about uh, with the Warnock Committee, um, and then later kind of the 14-day rule then kind of considered in the US and ultimately decided not to federally fund any work in which a human embryo was created or destroyed. Um, I'm kind of struck by the fact that the Stepto, Purdy, and Edwards papers were largely published in the 70s, um, and there was a live birth by IVF in 78, and the Warnock Committee report was published in 84. And so I think it begs a question of, I think we're again facing a situation where the science is advancing faster than the regulation, and how can we, I mean, and should we want to avoid another situation in which we kind of have what many would consider a kind of cultural impetus event that 
warrants huge kind of global considerations of these things or should we try to get ahead of it? And if so, how can we realistically do that? Because it's great that we're all here discussing these issues, but how do we get regulators and stakeholders across the board, like what happened in the Warnock Committee, to do that again for things they don't fully understand at this point in time? Okay, maybe I can start yep. with that one. Um, yep. I mean, the, the reason why the UK seems to be quite good at this is because you have, you know, you have the, the act for the law uh, and that empowers the regulator, the HDFA authority, to interpret the law, and um, they have their own, you know, more detailed guidelines and things. So the regulator can be much more flexible than the law. So um, ideally, that's what you want. You want something which sets the hard boundaries in law, and then a regulator who will make sensible decisions, what we think are sensible decisions, of course. Um, now, they will be subject to all sorts of pressures from the public and those against, those for, and everything. But they, they, if they've got that flexibility, they can, generally, they can be given the, sort of the authority to do a good job in, in, in our respect, so how, we, how scientists might think of it. Um, so the problem with many countries is that they have these sort of fixed hard laws, which then, you know, they're inflexible. You can't do much. Um, now, the, the, the act in the UK has got very tired now. So in 2008, we anticipated lots of things there. We made it really quite flexible, lots of changes. You know, we anticipated the possibility of doing, you know, human genome editing, in, in a way, on, on early human embryos back in 2008. Of course, we didn't have any human genome editing possible then. But we, that was written into the act then. So when Kathy Nyken puts her proposal to the HFA to, to do this type of work, she, she was granted a license because it was already... So what we want is you guys to think, you know, think what is going to be happening over the next so many years that, and can this be built in, into the law in a way that it makes it sufficiently flexible that the regulator can uh, have a sensible approach to saying, well, this is permissible, this is not. So that, that's my view of it. So um, I think, you know... Yeah. That's the, way, that's the way to do it. But it, you know, each country has its own track record, and it's really hard to, to change these laws in a way that allows that flexibility. Let's take a question from the stream. Yeah, so I think this um, so has partly been answered, but partly follows up on it. So I'll sort of slightly um, build on the question from the stream, which is really around CRISPR genome editing um, in human embryos, and particularly sort of for um, reproductive purposes and sort of um, obviously, at the moment, this is this is banned, although it has you know <laughs> has happened um, in China, and just sort of where the where the regulations with that um, might be going, and how we protect against um, people perhaps with good intentions ending up doing what we might consider to be to be bad. And I guess this is directed, I guess, both for you, Robin, and, and for Sarah as well, um, particularly. Mm. Uh, you want to go first or me? Because I I could say a lot too much, but. <laughs> Um, well, I think it, you know that is <coughs> one of the areas. I agree with yeah. Robin that that uh, we want to be flexible and ahead of the game, and that is one of the areas that definitely is is, is relevant, kind of from a regulatory and legal point of view. Um, I want to sort of go back and raise one thing that that Emma said, which is um, you know how research is prioritized, and 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 that we're doing research, uh, you know, ultimately, I think for beneficial purposes. And I would say that there have been. Lots of success stories. You know, the research has advanced our response to the pandemic incredibly quickly. I mean, yeah. in miraculous time, and that's the the collaboration between academia, biotech, and pharma that's achieved that. And and um, I think it's it's you know the public is really on our side. I think to a great extent from that, and we need to ride that wave and keep on giving the message that together with biotech and pharma, academic research is is responding to challenges. Now, how things are prioritized, I agree with Emma, that is a little bit higgledy-piggledy sometimes, and it's kind of sort of um, sort of happenstance thing is where does um, basic research funding, philanthropic funding, venture capital, you know, pharma investment and so on, it's not, it's not as aligned always as it was in the pandemic because of, you know, for obvious reasons, everybody was laser sharp focused on that one thing. But, it, but in general, you know, we, we've, we've achieved uh, huge advances kind of together, and it's worth sort of bearing that in mind and keep and, and, and reiterating that positive message 
um, that, that you know, the scientific community as a whole across that academic biotech pharma divide is continually pushing the boundaries. Um, yeah, with respect to the, um, you know, to the CRISPR editing, and I guess that comes back to what I said about drumline gene editing, um, you know, I think, again, together, you know, there, there will be beneficial applications of that, and, and, yeah. and we just need to address that and think about what the regulation around it should be. So, the, I mean, I was on, on the WHO uh, committee that looked at governance for that whole area, and I recommend everyone reads our reports on that, of course. <laughs> um, but, you know, basically you can't rely on, a, you know, to govern this throughout the world, you can't rely on a single mechanism. So you have to have multiple mechanisms that, that are helping to control the activity of rogue scientists. Um, and um, so peer pressure is important. You know, journals can be important, grant giving bodies are important, but you also have to have, you know, everyone be on track and say, you know, these methods are not yet safe enough. You should not proceed until you have some uh, certainty that what you're doing is going to be safe. It's very hard to get to that point. Actually, having embryos you can grow beyond 14 days would be a useful way of doing it because then you can take the embryos further and check that everything's all right. Um, having embryo models, all these things would be, be helpful. Uh, but it's going to be very hard to take that jump until you, you've really got to have a good degree of confidence. So anything you do that's risky, um, you know, the benefit also has to, you know, has to, if you like, outweigh the risk. Therefore, you have to choose very carefully what would be the first application. And that is going to be, the, the, I think, the big question. Uh, your commission looked at that. Yeah. Yeah. Fasting. Hi, um, I have a very quick question. So what is if there is a, a very clear cut case to use say human genome editing to fix something really terrible? Um, but what is if they're in the process of, you generate a lot of metadata that, um, so, you know, let's take hair color as an example. Would, would what is, uh, as you're currently thinking about whether this, this data will then not be made available to the, to the, to the, to the parents, or, so what are your sort of thoughts on that? <laughs> well, that, you know, that's already happening now. You know, you can do uh, polygenic risk scores on an early human embryo. In the US, you can pay companies to do this for you. And you can choose an embryo with, you know, with particular hair color if you wanted to. So that's nothing to do with genome editing. So that's, that's already an issue. Mm. So, um, I, you know, personally, again, I think that's, it's rather a crazy approach because, yeah, you may choose a nice, you know, blonde, blue-eyed boy if that's what you want. Mm. Um, but they may, you may have missed the fact that they're going to have, you know, early heart disease or, or something. So you've got to be, you know, you've got to really look at things carefully if you're going to start using p polygenic risk scores on an embryo. Right, so we are in the final minutes of the session. Is there any other burning comment? There's a hand raised at the back. Let's take this uh, as a last uh, comment. Hi, I, I, I guess I just wanted to ask one question, which is where would you draw the line then? So you're making a case, and Robin's making a case for being able to work up to a certain point now, we're going to be able to make embryos from ES cells that are non-integrated, and that, you know, if that's the case we're making, where would you stop? Where would you stop those embryos? So, I don't think I catch the question correctly. What? What's the limit? What would be the limit of growing human embryo? Ah. And okay, okay. So, so that is yeah. you. You are you are raising question related to this. Yeah. 14 day. So I, I, didn't, I didn't give a limit. Um, yeah. And in fact, the, the ICC, our guidelines don't give a limit um, because it was impossible to agree on one. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, you could have it, just you leave it up to the regulator. So if the case can be made really compelling for mm. taking it to this stage, then what's wrong with that? Mm. It's got to be a really compelling case as opposed to taking it just this far when the case may be mm. not quite so serious. Um, you could fix on a particular time. Um, it's, you know, the 14-day rule is sort of useful because it also coincides with the onset of gastrulation, so you have a nice morphological marker. 
So you could choose 28 days roughly uh, because that's when you have closure of the anterior neural pore. Um, you could choose six weeks um, according to Patrick because that's when you, you can recognize all the early organ primordia. Yeah, that's right. Um, I don't know. It's not for us. We, you know, we, w we want to know what the public think about this and, and how far you know, they would be comfortable with, with us taking embryos. And I'd like to add with yeah. uh, that as well is that you know, the 14-day rule was a rule that was developed independently, in fact, in the United States. Uh, which also um, was thinking about uh, embryo culture in the era of the emergence of IVF and the birth of Louise Brown. The UK was thinking about that independently, and that's the Warnock report, and they somehow both came up with 14 days independently. But that was through public engagement that took two years. Mm -hmm. And so we've been working under that governance, which was a partnership between the public uh, ethicists, scientists, stakeholders, uh, to create that first rule. So, so my question is, shouldn't we be doing that again to yeah. move it forward, rather than scientists telling the public what they should do? So we have yeah. to engage them again. Yeah. Yep. All right, so we have to draw this to a close. Any panel member have a final say? In the I wise just, word? <laughs> I, I just wish to say that I think that's what we are doing right now. That's why we have those discussions. And the first discussion of that sort, I remember, it was 2016, when we published the result that we can go beyond day seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, Baroness Warnock attended this meeting, and it was very interesting to hear her view. Her view was it's incredible that it took so long to go beyond day seven. And often it means that people don't really understand that this development until day seven is very simple. And this development beyond day seven is extremely complex because embryos start to grow for the first time, have totally different requirements. So often, you know, this discussion sort of started at that moment. And I think that's why we are having today this panel. And I think it's very, very important to really know what you think and what public thinks. So that's really great that we are doing that. Yeah, and just, just remember that you know, the 14-day rule has been a fabulous contract, if you like, with the public to allow us to do the research up to that point. And so if we're going to, you know, scientists want to break that contract, they have to have really good reasons for doing so. And that's what I mean. We have to get the justification for doing it. All right. On, on that note, I will thank the panel and the audience for the participation and discussion. Um,